And hello, everyone. Welcome to our, uh, I don't even know, what's this, the sixth, uh, sixth show so far of uh, Practical WebAssembly, where we talk about uh, all sorts of stuff WebAssembly-ish and uh, how to actually use it in the real world. We actually haven't talked all that much about using it in the real world yet. We need to get to that. Maybe we'll get it to it today. Um, but with me today, uh, I've got Shazabe, Phil, and Fawad, and I am Jared. Uh, say hello, guys. Hello. Howdy. Hello. That was enthusiastic. I'm feeling tingles all throughout my body right now. <laughs> oh, that was good. That was good. All right. So uh, the way we start these uh, these things off uh, is uh, with some sort of intro topic. And because uh, it is October 21st when we're recording this, hopefully uh, it is up shortly after that. Uh, we are nearing Halloween and uh, it'll be a good time to talk about something Halloween. -y. And uh, we talked about this earlier. You guys all have at least gone and dressed up as something at some point in your lives what was the what was the what was the costume well maybe not the best costume what is the costume you are most uh willing to talk about uh in a pseudo public <laughs> setting uh let's go with uh let's start with Fawad yeah um so this was like four or five years ago and I have no idea why I did this but um I spent a lot of time making a wind dancer outfit and uh, I, I sewed it and everything. And uh, it was great. It was a big hit. Like, I think I was invited to a get together, a Halloween get together, which is like very rare for an adult like me with kids to attend. And so like, oh, okay, I got to go big. Right. And so, yeah, uh, a wind dancer. And then, you know, I was doing the dance. Well, hold, hold, hold on a second. I've never, ever heard of it referred to as a wind dancer i had to google it to understand what you were talking about it was like the like the inflatable wiggly arm guys right yes wow all right so <laughs> wind dancer it is yes inflatable wiggly arm guys ah uh, that sounds like it should have been a hit oh yeah it was a big hit i'll need to find a video of me uh <laughs> well, please do Fawad, please <laughs> Uh, did all you right. did you sell any used cars out of the deal? You know, <laughs> so then like um, the next year there was a community garage sale, and like it took my wife a lot of effort to get me off of like the sidewalk and like doing that. So I tried. Oh, that is good. That, that's good we'll have to we'll have to put you outside of like conferences or something or like if, if we were to get a booth in a conference you could be the the inflatable uh wiggly arm guy oh yeah i'd do it all right who's up next I'll that go. was that that was phil phil now phil phil definitely oh. volunteered there no that was <laughs> uh, yeah i don't know if mine's like like i don't know if i can follow that up but um, I don't even know how old I was. I mean, I, I don't have any recent memory of dressing up like I became a father a long time ago and now it's all about them. Um, but I do remember kind of dressing up to, as this like grim reapery thing where my like mom made the like the cloak, but I didn't have a reaper. I had like a, a homemade I, The pr part I'm pr most proud of is I made a homemade axe instead of a like a sickle. Right. And it was like it had a foil, like I used tin foil to like cover the blade and it was all shiny and like, like nice and flat. Like, yeah, it was pretty badass battle axe, man. <laughs> um, but, you know, like that's that's what I remember. Uh, you know, outside of that, it's like baseball players and just, you know, generic stuff. But like the 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 Grim Reaper with the battle axe was was uh, what I remember the most. So now when you say baseball players, like, did you play baseball growing up? Yeah, I played Little League. All right. So so by baseball player, it was a, it was your baseball uniform repurposed? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, oh, crap, I forgot to buy a uniform. So let's just uh, put this Little League uniform on. And yeah, there you go. No, I, I mentioned that because, yeah, I, I think any anyone in similar situation went through that. It's like, oh, you've, you've got your costume. No, mom, I want this. No. 
no, you're you're going to be a soccer player. All right, Shazay, take it away. Uh, okay. Mine's was also a long time ago, back when I was a kid. I haven't really dressed up recently. Um, and it was sort of bittersweet. I think I was very young, and Power Rangers was my favorite show. And I really thought that little thing they had on their wrist really did actually make the costume come out. And so, yeah, when I went to get the, the costume, I still remember. I like I loved it when I wore it, but I was very, very disappointed um, when the, the whole costume didn't cover me fully just by pushing a button on my wrist. Um, so I was I did go trick or treating, but I was not as happy as I wanted to be. And that's my one Halloween dress up memory. I think I gave up after that. <laughs> oh man you just you just gave me a memory that is gonna age me probably a lot but uh, anyone remember dick tracy the yeah. movie back in the day warren Beatty, like from based off a comic but they have these like the like uh watches so you press a button it's like a walkie-talkie and you can talk to whoever and i remember saving up and and getting something that was advertised as like the dick tracy like the watch thing and then getting it and finding out that it wasn't actually a walkie talkie that could talk to anything. And oh man, like that, that broke the glass on, I think just advertising in general, it's like, everything's awful now. I'm never going to be happy ever again. The world is a lie. Uh, but for costumes, so this year, I guess I'm the only one still doing this stuff. I've got, uh, I got these nice giant, like aluminum stilts that oh. I'm uh, turning into this, uh, this, this large beast of a costume when I've got these, uh like really nice uh long um crutches that i had when uh, i bought when i broke my ankle a while ago so putting together this uh this large uh beastly walking thing i started a little late the this kind of snuck up on me so i might have to delay this for next year and then like work on an entire on it for an entire year if i can't rush it um but we'll see what it amounts to next week uh but i I've, I'm, i i like to go big that's wow that's uh, that's really hey. It's like that's like a Comic Con level of effort. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Well, I thought you were gonna do Forrest Gump, honestly, when I first saw those, but <laughs> you're just <laughs> <No. sitting right laughs> there. D- D- different, different sort of uh, braces. Okay, yeah, I'm taking out an insurance policy on you right after this. Uh, it's it's not a bad idea. I'm I'm <laughs> probably gonna hurt myself. Have to have to lay off the the drinks that people pass out in the neighborhoods that we're going to, which is also that's one of the fun things like with the kids. Like there's neighborhoods and they just like to hand out beers and jello shots, which is uh to the kids. Well, it depends <laughs> on how old they look, I guess. It depends on what they're getting dressed up as. But no, for parents. All right. Web assembly stuff. Uh where's our agenda? All right, community news. Uh for anyone who fancies themselves a speaker, the WASM IO call for proposals uh, has just opened up. WASM IO is the conference. Uh, I think it was what Spain. Oh man, I don't have a tab. Oh, there we go. Uh, Barcelona. Barcelona. So there's a great opportunity to be a WebAssembly oriented speaker in uh, a very very cool destination. Uh, so dust off your proposals. Uh, and submit them to WASM.io. I think the CFP ends in January, so you got some time. Uh, but if you're anything like me, uh, then you'll wait to the last week and do it in a rush anyway. So uh, don't do that. Get it done now. Um, you guys speak at all? You guys are conference uh, conference goers, speakers? You know, I never felt like people cared about what I thought. So. Oh, that's the trick. <laughs> you just talk and you let them make the decision. Right. If they walk out, then you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I nothing. was trying to uh to get in more of that stuff, and then COVID literally canceled the first conference I was going to speak at, you know. So them's the breaks. Lucky for you, there's this hot new conference whose CFP just opened. So you oh. have more chances. And uh, it turns out I might have some things to talk about too. Always uh, a great marrying of situations. Yeah, that's uh, I, I I spoke a lot before uh, before COVID, and COVID really crushed everything. Getting back into the swing of things now. I'm um, talking at all things open uh, November first or second. I forget which day. Um, so in a, about a week and a half or so, and uh, that'll that'll be 
well, I guess one of the first conferences since COVID, but that's a big one. That's a, that's a fun one. Uh, next up, uh, we have uh, a fun uh, investor article uh, called What's Up with WebAssembly? Compute's Next Paradigm Shift. Uh, did you guys read this? Or did you skim it? Did you look at the pictures? The, the picture Pretty wasn't pictures. very relevant to the article, though. So, you know, it was a little misleading. I, I, I could not look at the picture and get the context clues needed to have a good conversation. Oh, I guess I should I should share my screen a little bit because uh, we do have we have we have YouTube subscribers now. We we have uh, we got a comment. Uh, we have six subscribers. So outside of the five of of us, that means that there's at least one definitely not a subscriber. Uh, and I think it was Jonathan King. So Jonathan, if you if you're listening to this, uh, <laughs> thank you so much for for propping up our YouTube channel. It's it's much appreciated. Uh, and for the people on YouTube, I guess we should give you something vis visual. Sorry. Uh, so for the uh, the comment, was the comment first? No, no, it was it was better <laughs> than that. Um, but yeah, this is uh this is the article we're talking about. Um, and the reason why I'm bringing it up is that this is a this is a great way to get like a rundown on like what's what in WebAssembly. How are people thinking about WebAssembly? Who's who's doing what? Where do they stand? It's got this. Uh, the investors love these like uh, single graphic uh, images that that sh lay out an entire landscape with really really tiny logos. Uh, but it's a it's a great way to just just get the rundown on WebAssembly. Uh, who is using it? Uh, give you some terms to to Google if you're trying to uh, get WebAssembly to go anywhere in your company. Uh, things like this are great to show any naysayers, product owners, executives, whatever. Be like, hey, uh, let's see, uh, Adobe's using it, Figma, Shopify, Disney. Uh, and then that gives them the FOMO, which which allows you to do all sorts of fancy new stuff. And uh, that's all we want, isn't it? Uh, let's see. Lots of cool companies up on that picture. There are, and, and it would have been it would have been disappointing if we weren't on there. But it's nice to have, it's nice to have us right there, along with a bunch of good people. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, Fermion, Second State guys, uh, uh, Cosmonic, uh, Suborbital, like a bunch of just really, really awesome people. The Crustlet, uh, Crustlet projects up there, uh, Wasmers around, uh, Fastly, obviously. Like it's, it's just a bunch of awesome people, uh, and it's nice to, nice to be there. Uh, I, you know, what I would say about this article is, um, if someone came to me and didn't have much pre-existing knowledge about WASM, I would probably send them to this article now because I think it's a good primer of like, it sets you up from the beginning of like, why why WASM and why should you care all the way to the players and what are the possible use cases? So I don't know, I think this is a, a really good, I mean, it's impressed how much they packed into such a little space. Yeah, investors are really, really good at doing that. Uh I, I love I love when they distill years and years uh, of work down to a few paragraphs and a few images. Uh, it saves everyone else a lot of time. Uh, this next the next one I'm bringing up uh, uh, is an article by Justin Warren. Uh, AI slash ML is the killer app for WebAssembly, and I think I'm mostly bringing it up because uh, it, it, it like one of the headers is why use a Wasm Voltron and i remember like way back in the day describing this uh this like web assembly future as voltron esque and uh it just it 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 was it, it filled my heart full of 80s cartoon joy um but i, I the article is good uh for other reasons as well not necessarily related to uh giant robots made out of lions uh but one thing I wanted to to uh, call out was that like it's it's talking about the the same stuff that everyone's talking about WebAssembly all over the place. Like it's a uh, AI ML is certainly one use of plugging all these things together. Um, but really, just like getting to a place where there's less overhead uh, than Kubernetes and and uh, containers for building applications, and this is far beyond uh, AI and ML. This is this is every bit of software everywhere, plug in everything together 
and just having it work and not having to recompile things, being able to reuse stuff more effectively with less integration, like that is that is huge for everyone. And uh, this is this is this is the future. It's nice to it's nice to see that everyone's well, nice to see that people are uh, like coming on board with that idea all over the place. You guys uh, spend much time in the machine learning world, identifying pictures of cats and hot dogs. In a former life, it was definitely uh, important to prevent fraud. That's my diving into that world. But yes, usually from, from the angle I come from it, it's more or less consuming the models, not necessarily populating or training them. Uh, I think uh, what we're seeing in some of that article that you just showed is like, hey, uh, WASM could be a really interesting data pipeline for training models as a, in addition to consuming them. So... Yeah, exciting stuff. ML is hot. ML is hot. I'm glad we're a little bit past the uh, the AI hype from a few years ago, where AI was going to take over the world. And uh, if you didn't have AI somewhere in your product description, uh, you were clearly a failure. Now we've come back a, a little bit closer to reality uh, and and things are now uh, much more grounded in, in practical uh, AI use cases. Uh, next up, we got VMware Labs uh, making news in the WebAssembly world with their WASM Workers server. Uh, Phil, you looked at this a little bit, didn't you? I did. I didn't. I wouldn't say I looked at it too much, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's uh, what it does is very straightforward, simple, and to the point, right? So yeah. it depends on your use case, but like if you're looking for sort of a, a serverless -y type of thing that runs a handler based on a URI prefix, like that's it. That'll do it. Yeah, it's a, definitely like a, a, a solid thing to look at and try. Uh, I like their, uh, their Twitter thread. Um, so they're now excited to announce WASM worker server, a self-contained server to run your workers in WebAssembly. Uh, install, write a handler and server requests in less than five minutes. Uh, and then the follow-up. Oh, the follow-up's not here. Remember that barometer, though. Five minutes. Well, they say follow five minutes. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so we are so sorry. There was a typo in our, in our announcement. You can install, write a worker, and run it in less than one minute. We said five <laughs> minutes, which was a totally unrealistic number. And uh, I like I, 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 I like that. I thought it was cute. And I like that it's like the WebAssembly communities in general. It's just like they're, they're pushing each other really hard to get a a uh, fast and easy way to to take advantage of WebAssembly, uh, which is awesome because it actually, it is, it's kind of a bear to work with by default and everyone pushing each other to make it fast and as easy as possible is better for everyone. So one thing that I've noticed is really just how VMware seems to be pretty aggressively focusing on WebAssembly uh, for a company that's built on virtualization. I think that going back to uh, the that investor article saying that, oh, you know, this is going to be a pretty defining technology. Well, <laughs> I, I think that VMware sees that because they definitely see, oh, okay, I like if we're built on OS virtualization, how do we get this next uh, catch this next fad of uh you know virtually virtualization and isolation yeah definitely it, it is it is extremely popular on that side and i think i mean same for the it's, it's the same reason we were just talking about it's like it's it's less overhead than the stuff people are using now to achieve the same the same sandboxing uh isolation uh everything so it's it's uh everyone's moving in, in the the same direction and the people who are at the edge are really doing some awesome things with WebAssembly. Uh and, and by edge, I mean the bleeding edge, not the network edge, because that is also a popular thing to talk about with WebAssembly. Uh 
finally on the community stuff, uh, ooh, share screen. I'll get faster at this. Oh, it's, it's dark. That's why it's confusing. Uh, Flavio uh, from um, Sousa has uh, submitted a whole bunch of pull requests to the Wasmheim engine provider for WAPC, which uh, greatly improves performance. So if you are using WAPC anywhere in your projects, uh, the Wasm Time provider is now uh, certainly up to date with Wasm Time, uh, the 1.0 releases uh, in general. Uh, performance improvements have made it uh, better all the way around. Uh, so thank you very much, Flavio. Uh, your work is greatly appreciated. Uh, thank you very much. Is all that right. not needed in WASMRS, or do we have it in WASMRS? Uh, so we are using WASM time, and uh, we are using similar ways of uh, instantiating uh, WASM time. Uh, we have had done some uh, similar things to what Flavio had done in WAPC, but we'll be taking uh, we'll be taking his experience and improvements uh, on the the and putting them in the WASMRS host. Um, so uh, for anyone who's uh, jumping in now, WASMRS is kind of like the spiritual successor to WAPC. WAPC was a, a good way to have individual requests and responses to WebAssembly modules. WASMRS is our uh, reactive streams implementation for WebAssembly, which gives you like full asynchronous uh, streaming support within WebAssembly. Uh, so there are a lot of parallels to, uh, to both and a lot of advancements in one uh, translate to the other uh, fairly well. Uh, which uh, brings us to uh, probably talking more about WASMRS and other stuff that we're doing. Uh, so we've we had talked about WASMflow um, some uh, a bunch of times in the past. Uh, WASMflow, when we were building it, we were trying to make it be uh, everything along with uh, like a way to connect uh, WebAssembly components together. And uh, so things like connecting to gRPC microservices uh, 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 over network queues, um, making uh, database providers connecting them as microservices, a lot of things that really weren't WebAssembly oriented, but were important for uh, connecting everything together. Uh, we have since uh, realized that those are very distinct things. And uh, we have moved a lot of the uh, the connection logic and uh, are calling that Nanobus. Phil brought a project called Nanobus uh, into Candle, which had a lot of this uh, this uh, similar uh, connectability. And now Wasmflow is shrinking into the connectability library and Nanobus is taking on the external connectability to everything else. Uh, we're calling the components that you can build with WebAssembly IOTAs, uh, so just small units of stuff. Uh, and IOTAs don't need to be WebAssembly, uh, just like they, just like we had talked about components in, in WASMflow, IOTAs can be anything. There are ways of just uh, encapsulating a bit of logic uh, that is reusable and connecting them together. And Nanobus is the way that all of those IOTAs uh, connect uh, to e e each other in the outside world. And WASMflow will be the uh, the flow based uh, component connection uh, once we have uh, moved forward with Nanobus a, a little bit further. Um, but uh, Phil, I think you've got some uh, fun stuff to show on the Nanobus and IOTA side. I do. See if I can get everything shared. All right, that worked well. Okay, cool. Terminal on the left and. IDE on the right. Uh, your faces are, are in the way, but I'll have to just deal with that. All right, cool. So we've also talked about this thing called Apex in the past. And so a quick rundown of what Apex is, is it's essentially a way to model an application using simple keywords like interface and type and so on. Uh, and be able to just define your data and the ins and outs and functions and so on uh, and have a lot of the boilerplate code generated for you or just taken care of dynamically for you, depending on how you want to use it. So 
uh, part of what Nanobus is doing and how we're going to be building IOTAs is to let Apex define um, essentially the ins and outs, the ingressy, egressy type type traffic and build everything uh, as much as it can for you, which actually turns out to be a lot. So I'm going to show you what that means. Remember the whole five minutes to, to wow that uh, the VMware mentioned. I'm going to do a little bit more with this demo so that it won't take only a single minute. But I'm pretty sure I could show you some some a decent amount of stuff in about five minutes or more, right? Well, get, you know, I'll walk through it, right? So we are building kind of a, a sample application called NanoChat. Uh, right now, we only have a tweet component into in it right now, um, and it's called Tweet, obviously. And uh, it's got some definitions in here, like posting a tweet. Uh, I'm going to show you some things. Uh, additional functions I'm going to add in uh, as a second round of the demo here. But uh, notice there are also some annotations in here, much like if you're familiar with .NET or Java frameworks, very much the annotation-based way of exposing interfaces over REST or HTTP is kind of how that works. And that's uh, essentially what's happening here. Uh, and Nanobus is taking care of exposing these interfaces for you um, as services. So down below, we have a tweet store, and that is annotated as a provider. And what a provider is, is just a interface that gives your component access to some database or some infrastructure service uh, outside of your application, right? So in basically what we're saying here is there's a interface that our tweet service uses to store tweet in the database. Um, so you can see there are things in here that uh, validate that the length is no more than 280 characters, um, and so on. So that's basically it. Um, and then we don't have to really go into like what a tweet looks like. It's got an ID, a user, a message, a timestamp, and so on. So that's basically it. And so over here, um, if I were to run this for the first time, uh, I could do, I run this thing called just, which is kind of like a make file alternative. And what it did is it generated uh, all of these files um, just by running the, this code generation process. And in fact, um, in the background with VS Code, it's actually monitoring this file. So I'll show this in a bit when I uncomment these things, but anytime I make a change to this file, all the boilerplate code updates transparently. You don't even see it. Uh, it's not hidden from you or anything like that. Like I can actually go in and see what it generates and see that there's these tweet records and it does it for the language that I'm working in. But uh, all the stuff updates. So like basically the, the source code of record, if you will, is this Apex file. And uh, that generates all the boilerplate. So now all I have to do is fill in uh, this, this uh, it's right now it's service.go. This is where my business logic is. And so what I really have to do is implement this interface called tweet. And so in Go code, it's actually going to scaffold this out. I've already filled it in with just the piece that does the storing of the tweet. and that's actually really simple because the, the interfaces for those two functions are identical. So all I'm doing is just passing that thing along to the store tweet and it returns a tweet record. So that's easy. I'm just gonna go ahead and show that. I've already compiled it. You can see over here that uh, when the component compiles, it basically says, you know, hey, I've compiled and you know the things I export, the things that you can call from the outside is post tweet. And you'll see tweet store here where there's a store tweet. So this component relies on, it calls out to something that is going to store the database query. Um, and what I would show next real quickly is, you know, wouldn't it be nice to store this in a database? That's obviously like the place you'd want to stick this. You want to put it in some sort of relational database or perhaps a key value store. It doesn't really matter. But uh, in this demo, I basically have it going to a tweet stable. I'm gonna go ahead and just make sure that's cleared out. There were two in there, now they're gone. And uh, let's see. The thing I would show is the providers, just super quick. Um, these are defined outside of the component. And this is done very deliberately so that, you know, there's nothing in your component that can perhaps be a renegade query or, you know, even though you can lock down SQL databases and such, there's still nothing preventing you perhaps from running a delete from and just wiping out a table maliciously. So if it's untrusted code, you should probably have visibility into the types of things it's doing in your infrastructure. And so what this file does 
is essentially provides a data pipeline. So whenever you call tweet store, store tweet, it's basically saying, I would like to insert something into this Postgres database table called tweets. And there are lots of different ways you can interact with outside things like message queues and so on, keeping it simple with just a database for now. Um, but let's go ahead and run this thing. I'm definitely past the five minutes. So but while, all that's talk. While you're running that, um, is this bus file tied in with the Apex file? Like, in does it enforce a certain model on you? There, this is a good question. Uh, they should be in sync with each other, right? So really the code generator is going to be generating the necessary code for your component to call out um, to this provider. So this must match up uh, for it to be called to something that's defined in the Apex file. So the syntax for it is the namespace with a dot and then the interface name. And I have to go back. And that's that's basically what shows up here. And then the function name or method name is the next thing. And then comes your the steps of your pipeline. So that's so the long-winded answer to your question is yes, this has to sync up to the Apex file. Um, what I'm not going to show here today is there is a way to generate this YAML with uh, with TypeScript or other languages that are strongly typed so that you can actually create these things without fat fingering and it has type safety in it and uh, that won't be an issue. I'm just showing you the raw the raw thing that gets looked at by the engine. So real quickly to point out some things uh, for the developer inner loop, which is kind of like what I'm doing to test this thing locally, it will spit out some URLs that you can, you know, get to, to basically call the, you know, you can use Swagger. It also creates a Postman collection that you can import into Postman. Uh, it creates a, there's a cool little thing called VS Code or REST client for VS Code. I really like this. I'll actually be using this. Um, and so you've got some tools to help you with your inner loop development right there out of the box. So that's pretty handy. So I'm going to go ahead and actually use that plugin that I showed you uh, for, this is the uh, HTTP client one. So I'm going to go ahead and send some tweets. You can see that it's logging and showing you some of the traffic. The first thing that came in was the, the ingress to post the tweet. Then the next one is to say, hey, I'm calling this provider to essentially store the tweet in the database. And you'll see that it came back with a success. Um, notice that uh, I have a message in here with a hashtag that's going to be relevant here in a bit. And then I'm going to go ahead and tweet again, another one saying I'm demoing IOTAs defined by Apex, compiled to WASM, running on Nanobus. It's a lot to take in, but I'm going to tweet it. So same thing happened. It all wrote to the database. You know, I guess I could in theory say select from tweets and show you this stuff. Of course, I got to type it right. Oh, that's awesome. I got to say select star from. So there you go. There's the tweets I put in, timestamps and the whole nine yards and back to over here. So cool. All right, so I got some tweets in there. Now I want to write a function or add a function in here that uh, looks at the, the user's timeline. And let's go to the Apex, because I'm going to do this here. I'm going to write a, a Twitter page, so give me a page of tweets. Obviously, it'll get me the, the tweets themselves. But what if I want to like count the hashtags? I'm just kind of like a trending for this user. What are they writing hashtags about? So I've gone ahead and uncommented these types and put them into the data type there for the tweet page. Um, I am going to expose that method through a get, so to get the timeline. And I also need to be able to query those from the database. And so one thing I would point out here is that the way I've modeled this talking to the provider is when I'm running a query, I, uh, you know, normally when you're writing relational database code, you end up creating a query and then it returns some sort of cursor back or, you know, rows back that you iterate through and you look at things one at a time. In the IOTA programming model, we're using, as Jared mentioned earlier, reactive streams. And so to model that, I just put the stream keyword inside of uh, right before tweet record. 
And so for this user ID, what it will do, and we can go with, look at the query that it's running uh, in the bus and see that it's selecting all the fields from tweets where the user ID is the one that's being passed in. And it's, it's sorting it by uh, descending time order, right? And so now my component should have access to that if I call that, uh, if I save this, which I think I did, you can see all these things regenerated. You can see that main.go is complaining because I haven't implemented that method yet. And I will go ahead and uncomment that. And now it's implemented. And I'll just show you a little real quickly what the get timeline looks like. So I have a regular expression here to detect hashtags in the tweet. And so what it's doing is it's kind of keeping the tweet page object. Uh, it's populating this as it's going through the tweets. So it's doing store.getTweets. So store is the tweet store and the, is the provider. And it is every record that it's getting, a, a tweet record. It is incrementing the count of the hashtag because uh, it ran the regular expression on the message. It uh, implement, you know, increases the, the trending count for that tag. And it also appends to the, num the tweets that I want to return as the tweets array, if you will. And then on complete, uh, I basically take all those hashtags and put them in an array and sort it by greatest occurrences to least occurrences. So that's kind of what you'd want to see uh, on the front end if you were querying this from like a mobile app or something. And so that's basically it. So if I run just again, which is building this thing, it's running the code generation and building. You'll see I now have another export and another import for the two things I added in my Apex. And if I do Nanobus, run that again, I can go back and I have the request all ready to go. And you can see, I have to move our faces to see it. But uh, you can see that it brings back the tag counts. I tweeted about WASM twice, and I tweeted about all the cool little projects we're working on once. And here's the two tweets that I have put in uh, so far, right? So there you go. That is uh, WASM implementing business logic and calling out to uh, infrastructure, querying databases, and doing you know real world type stuff. Um, and if it weren't for me yapping about it, I think you can get this pr done pretty quickly. Would you say that this is a practical usage for WebAssembly? Yes, which, you know, I'm glad because it would otherwise not be shown on a podcast called Practical Wasm. It it's would be very good. important that, we, yeah, we make that tie. It's like the the Jurassic Park moment where where they finally say Jurassic Park in the movie and you, you point and you, you get it. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is uh, this is awesome. This is this is like there's so much cool stuff that that we're we're playing with daily. We're happy to to finally get to show some of the more modern stuff uh, to to you all. Uh, but this is this is like th there's so much more that we want to show, and we will get to it. Um, like even even the stuff that Phil glossed over at the start, like any any library that you build this way you get things like swagger postman rest client all for free and like the that 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 uh, the web assembly has no awareness whatsoever of a database at all it's just like a library uh, that ha that uh, that imports a call and right now the call is just happen to be implemented in yaml uh storing things to postgres and that's that's the Voltron-y stuff that we're talking about, where everything just plugs together into this this weird giant robot made out of lions. Yeah, we actually didn't talk much about the Voltron-y aspect of it. So we have this nano chat, which right now only has one component, and we have them under this IOTA's directory. There will be more in here as we build them, but there is a top level. Uh, bus.yaml, which is the thing that is tying them all together simply by saying import. And you can override anything that's happening down in the, the YAMLs that you're importing. Uh, if you want to change resiliency policies or change how the database query is working, you can point it to completely different tables, whatever. Uh, you have the ability to override things at the top layer here. So, uh, and this is where I'm exposing it over REST and HTTP uh, RPC. We have NATs and uh, gRPC isn't done yet, but it is something that is very low lying fruit. We can easily through using, again, something like Apex can get you gRPC uh, for free. You like don't even have to think about it. Um, 
you know, the other thing, like I, 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 with WASM, like the biggest challenge is the fact that it only conveys numbers. Like you can only pass in and return numbers. And so that puts the onus on developers to have to do a lot of memory passing and serialization and codex stuff. And you don't have to worry about that with this framework. In fact, you can see that the types that I'm defining in Apex show up as first class citizens already parsed and dealt with um, in the generated code and in the code that you write. So you're never having to JSON, unmarshal, marshal, any of those things when your your user code functions, like your call, it gets called. It already is, it's already dealing with the type that you want to deal with, right? So that's the other, I think, real smooth benefit uh, to all this stuff. And uh, Phil was uh, showing off the uh, the Go implementation of the WebAssembly that he's working on, uh, but we've got implementations uh, in Rust as well, and uh, we'll we'll be fleshing those out more and more uh, as we go. But the the goal is to be able to just have a, a whole slew of languages that compile uh, to this uh, R socket interface, and you just plug them together however you want. It's uh it's pretty awesome. Thanks, Bill. Sure thing. Uh, we are, we're closing in on our time here. Um, any, uh, Shazab, 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 Fawad, uh, you guys, uh, have anything that you want to add here? Not really, just, uh, reading those articles, even the investor one, it was pretty cool seeing investors talk about it and the hype. I am curious just how, this is just honestly, just, a out of curiosity how it works in tech is it like a gradual thing this adoption phase or is it just like uh once it like hits it's just like that one spark that's going to take it to like just blow up um, uh i don't know if fawad coined this or got it from somewhere but he he at one at one point said uh like a, it's a gradually then suddenly uh experience where uh like people where we are, we've been dealing with this for a while and it feels like it's like, holy crap, we've been saying the same things for ages. Uh, and eventually it's just going to be everywhere and that's going to be the age of WebAssembly. I think that's a, it's similar with, uh, with most technologies. The people in the depths uh, deal with it for uh, a lifetime and then the rest of the world picks up on all the benefits once people have figured out how to actually make it uh, practical for the rest of the world. Yeah, and so uh, please don't ever tell anyone that I made this statement. <laughs> I did not come up with this. It was somebody called, um, you might have heard of him, Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> mm, okay, okay. I knew it sounded familiar. So it sounded like something. <laughs> Maybe, maybe from a uh, high school. English. I, think, I, I simply recycled what, what he was saying to draw a parallel. We could do the Michael Scott thing where it's like he writes the quote, <laughs> whoever it was, and then pull out after that. Like, oh, perfect. Yes. We'll, yeah. we'll do that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone, to who's listening, uh, watching. Thank you, Jonathan King, for watching us on YouTube. Uh, we'll see you all next time. All right. Later, everyone.